Hi everyone and welcome to lovely Vienna where I am clearly based right now for the Ekrams 2021 conference. Unfortunately I'm not actually there, this is a virtual background and I've been attending virtually again this year. It's actually just gone 4am here in Melbourne. We've just finished day one uh, of the conference but before I get a few hours of sleep. I wanted to record this short video just to update you on some of the highlights and the, the key presentations that I heard today. So probably unsurprisingly, the first session of the day was around uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and multiple sclerosis. So there was a couple of really interesting presentations in this session that I wanted to draw your attention to. So the first one was from Maria Pia Somani from the University of Genoa. And she talked through a few things that they've been able to find out based on a really big data set that they've collected. Um, and one of the themes around this was the use of registries and the ability to collect big data across really large cohorts of people living with multiple sclerosis. And probably the best quote of the day um, that I'll just sort of take a tangent just to share with you was uh, by another presenter, Professor Helmut Putzquaven, who's also based here in Melbourne. And at the start of his presentation around the use of these registries, he sort of said, well, why do we bother to collect this clinical data? Why do we bother to quantitate what we're seeing in the clinics? And he had a very simple answer, and that's because we can use that data to improve the quality of life for people living with multiple sclerosis. So back to the, the COVID-19 data, Maria Pierce Samani presented uh, the data that they'd collected. And I think one of her big uh, takeaway messages from this is that we need to be really careful about how we analyse that data. And one of the, the factors that she pointed to was what's been perceived as the quite low death rate in terms of people living with multiple sclerosis that do get infected with COVID-19. And while that death rate may be quite low compared to the, the overall death rate that's been seen across the general population, what she said is that what we need to keep in mind with this is that people living with MS are going to tend to be younger individuals and there's more likely to be female. And being younger and being female uh, tends to be a little bit more protective in the general population when if you were to compare with the same age groups um, and the same gender, you may find that the death rate in people living with MS is actually higher um, than what we would think. So she just wanted to make sure that people are being a little bit careful about how they're analysing this information so that we're not underselling the risks um, in terms of uh, what COVID-19 can present for people living with multiple sclerosis. The other big point that she mentioned was around data that we've heard before, and we, we started to see some data published on this at, at MS Virtual 2020, but this is just around the risks of a COVID-19 infection for people living with multiple sclerosis that are on anti-CD20 therapies. And she said now that across all of the data that's been collected across all of these large data sets, she thinks that there is now a consensus that people on these therapies are at a slightly higher risk of having a more severe outcome uh, if they do have a COVID-19 infection. Now, it wasn't clear at the moment whether this took into account the vaccination status of these individuals. And certainly I think last year when they started to look at it, it didn't take that into account. So that will be another layer that will need to be built into this data analysis. Now, the other key presentation in this session was the Israeli data that we've shared with you before there was a little bit more information in this presentation. And so we'll go through that as well. Now, in this Israeli population, um, they have over 400 people living with multiple sclerosis now that are fully vaccinated, have had both doses, and everyone in that population has received the Pfizer vaccine. Probably one of the most important points um, that was raised during this presentation was that they saw no increased risk of relapse uh, from either the first or the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. Now, you may remember that in this data set, what they looked at was the ability um, for people living with MS on different therapies to generate a response to this vaccine. 
And so they had a few different groups. They had people living with MS who were on cladribine or maven clad. And in that group, they found that they were able to generate a really strong response to the vaccine. In fact, they generated basically the same response as people living with MS who weren't on any treatment and healthy controls. And what they also saw was that people on Fingolimod or Jelenia generated a much, much lower response. And in fact, looking at the data in the presentation today, they suggested that only one individual in that group generated a response that they were deemed to be uh, to give them any level of protection against the COVID-19 uh, infection. Similarly, they looked at uh, a group of people on ocrelizumab or ocrevus, and again, they saw a much lower response in these individuals. And in that group, they thought it was just, just under 23% of that group who probably generated enough of a response to have a level of protection against a COVID-19 infection. Now, what we're seeing more and more is that this isn't necessarily the whole story when it comes to these vaccines, and there is probably more information that we need. And so at least in terms of that ocrelizumab group, what they have found is that although this antibody response seems to be lower, they do seem to be generating a relatively meaningful T cell response. And so it's unclear at the moment as to whether or not that extra T cell response that's generated will give uh, extra protection and more meaningful protection against a COVID-19 uh, infection in people living with MS on ocrelizumab. In the Fingolimod group, however, they didn't have that T cell response. So in, in that group, they didn't have a B cell response or a T cell response generated to the COVID-19 uh, vaccine, Pfizer vaccine in this Israeli population. And so based on the data that they saw, they generated a few guidelines in terms of the timing that they would use. Now, remember that all of the MS organizations around the world have also published some information on this. So make sure that you are using that information as well. This is purely just relaying some information that was found in this presentation. So what they suggested was that for individuals on cladribine, um, they would be given the vaccine around four months after their last dose of cladribine. Now, interestingly, as I was sharing information across uh, Twitter live during the conference, I engaged with another researcher um, who thought that there was no need to wait four months for cladribine and that didn't line up with the data. So it may be possible that you don't need to wait four months. It was quite clear in this Israeli data that the reason that they chose four months was that there was no one in their population that had received a vaccine uh, at a, sh a shorter time period than that. So that's still a, a little bit of a work in progress. In terms of ocrelizumab, they suggested uh, nine months after the last dose. And in terms of fengolimod, they suggested that if possible, they would look into whether or not they could switch therapies before giving the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, again, this is just based on one population and this is one study. And so there is a lot more information needed about that. But it's interesting to get some updated data in this space. The other thing that was discussed around the COVID-19 vaccine is around the use of boosters. And there was a general consensus that boosters probably will be um, necessary for people with multiple sclerosis, especially on immunosuppressive medications, uh, although there is no data yet um, to share in terms of the effect that that has on the response and protection generated in people living with MS on different therapies. There was a little bit of a discussion around um, what vaccine is best. That was a question that came up um, from an audience member and Gavin Giovanoni gave a little bit of an answer around that, suggesting that it seems that the mRNA vaccines are able to generate a stronger response. So this is, this is Pfizer and Moderna, um, maybe generating a stronger response uh, than the AstraZeneca vaccine and potentially the Moderna generating a better response than the Pfizer vaccine. Again, um, this is all still quite preliminary and the key message was that it is better to just get whatever vaccine is available for you at the time. So obviously that was a major session today um, in terms of information that was presented, but there were some other talks that I just wanted to highlight quickly as well that I heard about today. So symptom management um, is a topic that has become quite big over the past few years at Ectrams. Uh, I think there's been 
a stronger realisation that as well as all of this information around how we can better manage the disease um, on the whole, people living with MS would like things to better treat the symptoms that are affecting their daily life and affecting their quality of life. And so one of the talks that I heard on that today was around um, sleep disturbances and potential treatment that can help with that. Um, and so this was a relatively small trial and we heard about this from Dr. Su, Dr. Sue, uh, sorry for that, Dr. Sue from the University of California, San Francisco. And so this was only a trial involving 30 people uh, living with MS and they were looking at using melatonin. And so they had 15 people take melatonin uh, for two weeks or, and then 15 people who were on placebo for those two weeks and then they switched them over. And so the results of this small trial suggested that the use of melatonin could uh, improve the total sleep time for people living with MS that did experience sleep disturbances. There was also a suggestion that it improved sleep quality and sleep efficiency and led to a reduction in fatigue. So interesting results, small trial, and they did suggest that this would need to be replicated in a much larger study. In terms of other presentations that we heard quite a lot about, as I just checked my notes to make sure, as I said, it's now going on for, for quarter past four in the morning here in Melbourne, so I just make sure that I'm relaying you the, the best information, so I made a lot of notes uh, as the conference was going on. Uh, in terms of some other presentations that were made um, around treatments, uh, so we had a presentation from Dr. Tim Spellman, um, who's based out of Sweden, was originally um, from Melbourne, and he presented some interesting data where he's looked at um, cohorts of people living with MS from Sweden uh, and Denmark and compared them where they have uh, two very different treatment approaches. So in Sweden, uh, he said that they tend to use much more of an induction approach. So this is where they will start individuals on a higher um, efficacy therapy, so a more powerful therapy at the start. Whereas in Denmark, they're more likely to use an escalation therapy. So uh, they'll start on a um, more moderate therapy and then start to go on to more powerful therapies if that individual fails on those earlier therapies. And again, what they found from this, and this is similar to other published data that's, that's come out over recent years, is that the earlier an individual goes onto a, you know, onto a highly effective therapy, the better their long-term outcomes are in terms of reducing disability progression. Um, similar to that, we had another presentation um, from Mirko Kapana from the University of Genoa, uh, and he was looking at the effectiveness of existing therapies in people with progressive MS. And so again, um, similar to other published studies that we've seen recently, he did find that there was a small but um, clinically and statistically significant benefit um, for people with progressive MS to be taking um, one of these immunomodulatory or immunosuppressive medications. However, that benefit was only seen if this individual had active disease. So this lines up with what we've seen, as I said, in these other studies, where if an individual with progressive MS still has some form of inflammation, then this is a target that can be treated. And so in these individuals, there is still some benefit to using some of the existing therapies. Speaking of progressive um, MS, the last session that I was in was talking about BTK inhibitors. So these are a group of potentially novel MS therapies um, that have been shown to potentially be effective in terms of being able to block disease progression. So BTK um, is found in cells that um, mediate both acute and chronic inflammation. So really involved in the disease process. And so they're looking at compounds that can block that BTK. So as they're called, BTK inhibitors. And so there are three, to, to highlight the potential success of this treatment approach, there's actually three separate compounds that have all made it through to phase three clinical trials that are ongoing at the moment. And these are uh, fenobrutinib, tolibrutinib, uh, and uh, 
third one that is escaping my mind at the moment. Let me scroll up in my notes. Uh, and Evo Brutney. So all three of these um, are in phase three trials. So that's that's quite exciting to have three separate compounds being um, pursued by three different groups, all having made it through to phase three trials. And what's particularly exciting about these trials is not only are they being trialed um, in relapsing or emitting MS, but all of them are also being um, trialed in progressive MS. And as we know, um, progressive MS is certainly an area where we need um, some more effective therapies to be made available um, for those individuals. So those are my highlights from day one. If you have any comments or questions about anything that you've heard in this video, please do post them below and I'll be happy to answer any of them. If not, uh, I'll be back tomorrow for day two for what will be another exciting uh, day of information and I look forward to bringing you more uh, highlights from that. Thanks, everyone.